joyful and triumphant. If you have a Bible, you can find the John chapter 6. We'll be looking at a verse in that particular uh, place this morning as we continue our Advent series of messages uh, on the invitations of Christ to us to come. Now, we've uh, looked at, uh, you know, a couple of those things already. Uh, we looked at an invitation to come uh, so that we can have life. We looked at an invitation to come like a child. And today, we'll look at an invitation to come, you'll never be turned away. Uh, it's always good to get an invitation, but I think it's even better to know that the invitation is always going to be honored. I mean, there's a little bit of doubt out there, right? If you get an invitation, especially from someone who is, you know, kind of high and mighty, someone who is of a, you know, a class that you think maybe wouldn't know who you are or wouldn't want to bother with the likes of you, uh, you, you can get that kind of thing and be doubtful about it, right? I mean, if, like, you know, the president invited me to come for a little soiree at the White House, I would think that maybe someone was playing a trick on me. You know, you just don't expect that kind of thing. Uh, you know, and if I went there on the strength alone of that invitation, you know, travel down to Washington, D.C., and show up at the White House, hey, where's Joe? I got an invite. I, I don't think I could do that. I don't think there would, I would have any confidence in an invitation such as that. But the, the, the invitation that we have from, from Christ to come to him is not an invitation that we need have any doubts about. It's an invitation that is going to be honored. And so in this invitation that we have from Christ, we have this promise that, that's along with it. And it says that if you respond to this invitation, if you respond to the invitation to come to me, there's absolutely no way in the world you're ever going to be turned away. I like that. I like that. Uh, I like that reliability. I like that, I like that comfort. Uh, this is something that a soul like me can count on. Because, you know, the thing that we're often willing to do, or the, if not willing is the right word, the thing that we sometimes fall into is somehow or another thinking that if we get such an invitation of that kind of a sort, we've got to somehow or another primp ourselves up. Right? We've got to get ourselves worthy. I remember when I was a, a young lad, um, uh, uh, my best friend's family uh, decided to, uh, to invite me along to a trip to the Caribbean. And of course, my mom and dad were simple folks. And... Um, you know, they told my mom we were going to be, you know, cruising around on a sail ship, you know, across the islands. And, uh, you know, she just conjured up in her mind, I think, you know, all the things that, you, that that might mean. And so she quick took me out to the store and started buying me clothes. And I said, I don't think this is what this is all about. Um, all I really needed was a bathing suit because we were on a sailboat <laughs> sailing around the island. So, you know, on our own little boat. Um, so, uh, but... Uh, she wanted to print me up and make sure I had what it took to, you know, live up to this invitation. You know, so we can think that way, right? When it comes to an invitation that we get from a mighty and a holy God. An invitation like that says that if I'm going to respond to this, right, if I have any uh, reason to think that somehow or another I could respond to this, I've got to print myself up. I've got to somehow or another, you know, kind of clean up the... The, the, the dirty edges, I've got to, you know, press my shirts, I've got to shine my shoes, i I got to do something, right, to somehow or another make me feel like maybe I'm more fitting, more worthy of such a thing. i got to tell you today, that does not, that kind of thinking does not enter in to this invitation or the promise of it. <laughs> Jesus made us an invitation and he knew exactly because that's just how smart he is, that's how seeing he is. He knew exactly who he was making this invitation to. He made it to you and to me and to everyone else. And he says, if you come to me, it doesn't matter what's in your past. It doesn't matter how you know, we have a speckled plant here. It doesn't matter if your past is that speckled. Right? It has nothing to do with the invitation. Jesus is going to make you just as whole and pure as, as this thing here. Right? It doesn't matter what kind of past you have. It doesn't matter what kind of things you've done. It doesn't matter what kind of shame that you 
feel that you would bear before a, you know, a holy and awesome God, you have an invitation. And Christ says that if you will respond to that invitation, right, there is just absolutely no way that you're going to be turned away. Now, in, in uh, understanding this, we're going to do a little bit of uh, we're going to do a little bit of uh, exegetical work here on on these verses, just so that we understand how strongly this point is made in the language that we have. Verse number thirty-seven: All those that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. All those that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Now we can jump into this. Now this first phrase, all that the Father is giving me, uh, that's how it really should be translated. It says in the NIV, and I think in probably just about uh, all the English translation, uh, those that the Father gives me, uh, which I don't think it really does justice to what's there in the, uh, the underlying original language. Um, it's written a certain way. It's present indicative active if you're interested in such things. Um, and what that is stating is that something is happening in the present. Something is happening in the now. So he's not saying all that the Father gives me in the sense that you can't take that, that phrase to mean that the Father did this a long time ago. You can't take this phrase to refer to, like for instance, some lost period of time before the creation of the world, somehow or another, that maybe in that lost kind of timeless place, there was a, a decree of the Heavenly Father to put forth a, a statement that said that these people will belong to Jesus. That's not what it's saying. That's, that's not even close to how this can be taken. Now, some folks take it that way. So if you're of a Calvinistic bent, you might you know look at it this way. But it's actually an error to do so because the language here in this text doesn't allow that. This is happening in the present. So as Jesus is speaking this thing, God is giving him these folks. This is not something that was put in rock or set up way in some faraway age in the past. This is something that's happening in the moment. This is something happening in the present. God, the Father, is giving Jesus people giving people are giving Jesus people in that moment that that Jesus is speaking this, this is not uh, this is not about preordination this is not about uh, this is not about uh, election this is not about any of those things this is just uh, an understanding of what God is doing with people uh, in relationship to Christ in real time so he's not talking about that kind of thing um, secondly, we come to the, you know, the next uh, phrase here, and it says that all of these people that, that, uh, that the Heavenly Father is giving Christ, uh, it, you know, we hear that they will come. Um, literally, uh, that, should, that really the concept there is that they will arrive. Uh, you know, when we think of coming, we think of process more. So when you look at, at the English and you see the word come, you know, you, what you're thinking probably is somebody driving in a car. Put, 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 put. Ah, get out of my way, you slow boat. Oh, wait a second, that's just me. Uh, put, 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 put. You know, they're, on, they're in the process. They're going from point A to point B, right? They are on the way. Um, and when you hear a word like come or when you read a word like come, that might be what you have in mind. But the word literally means to have arrived. So when it says that all that the Father is giving me in this moment, what he's saying is all of those people will undoubtedly reach the destination. They will have arrived. That, you know, that's really a, would be a good way to translate that. All that the Father gives me will have arrived at me. Uh, this is the point that he's making. And in making this point, he is trying to speak, it seems to me, to the inevitably, inevitability, there we go, I'll get that out, the inevitability of what he's talking about. So when he says that, that the Father is giving me people and these, uh, all of these people that are, uh, that are given to him, they will inevitably come to him. Uh, there is uh, something that, that uh, um, is uh, uh, not in any way in doubt that it's not in any way uncertain. This is something that is absolutely uh, going to come to pass. And then he adds it, you know, from that point of view, he adds it 
to it the next phrase, which kind of, you know, kind of adds a little level of confusion to this because he says, and the one coming. So all that the Father is giving to me will come to me, and the one who comes, all right? And so we have this, the one who comes added to that, the framework of those things, and it's a little confusing because of the way that it sets out grammatically. Now, it, you know, if you're interested in the grammar of it, um, the one who is coming, this, uh, this coming here is, is a present participle middle accusative. That's the way that parses out. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that, that uh, you really have a verb that is, because it's a participle, it's not used to describe action. It's really there to describe ad adjectively. So it's an adjective. It's not really acting as a, as a verb. And so uh, what you have is this description of somebody coming. A person is, is coming is a description of a person, not, not uh, actually what they are doing. And it's put into this middle voice uh, to describe something that I think is very important, especially given the first phrase that we looked at. When you see a middle voice in the, uh, in, in the Greek, it means that the, the actor of the, uh, of the verb is not having something done to him, that would be passive. So like I, if I say, why are you hitting me? You know, that would be in the passive tense, or that would be in the passive voice, and what that would convey is that something is happening to me, and I, I, I'm not really, I don't really have any part in that other than being on the receiving end of it. But when things are in the middle voice, what it means is that the person who is, is uh, uh, doing the acting is also experiencing in some way the action. And so you have a participation, if you will, in the action. So when you see the middle voice in the Greek, uh, it, you're, you're seeing that something is meant to be communicated, that whoever is doing that acting is not being acted upon as if they're being carried along, but they are participating in the action. So the one who is coming is not being drug along, is not being carried along against their will, is not being carried along against their, their, their effort. They are being carried along and they are acting in conjunction with it. Now why is that important? Well again, if you know, there are some folks that think that everything that happens with God was decreed a long time ago. God made a decision and now everything else just unfolds in time. Um, quite apart from any consideration of will or determination by people that everything gets carried along and everything that basically falls out is God's will and there's no way to circumvent it or to undo it. This is all going to happen. And they apply that kind of thinking you know, for everything including someone responding to the invitation that we have from Christ. But what this text tells us is that's not the way it works. When people respond to the invitation that we have in Christ, they will be participating in that effort. In other words, God won't believe for you. God won't come for you. God won't get right with Jesus for you. In all of those kinds of thoughts and considerations, if we can use those as, as maybe parallels to the thought of coming to Christ, what we learn from this text is in all of those cases, guess what? Those that come to Christ, come to Christ in participation with that effort to come. Now, you know, again, if, if you look at thoughts like predetermination, and if you look at thoughts like, like election, if you look at like, uh, thoughts like foreordination, you can actually mistake those kinds of concepts as they are presented in the Bible, and, and it makes you think that somehow or another, if you're the one of the chosen of God, that's, sight, uh, that's signed, sealed, and delivered. It doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how you respond, it doesn't matter how you're involved with it, right? It's signed, sealed, and delivered because it was God's will and that's it. But that's not how the Bible describes responding to the invitation of Christ. The Bible describes responding to the invitation of Christ as something that you have to be a willing participant in. It's something that in the capacities that God has given you as a human being, you've got to come to some level of agreement with. You have to come to terms with. And if you don't come to that level of agreement, you don't come to, that, to those terms where you are a willing participant, it's not going to happen. 
it's not going to happen. I mean, we will see before the, this series ends that, that, that the whole notion of uh, the whole picture, maybe we could say, uh, of fishing will come into play at, at some point in time. Um, but I got to tell you uh, that when it comes to the re invitation that we have to come to Christ, um, we are not dead, dumb fish out in the sea that get hooked by a, a line and get quite a, apart from our consideration or our will, get yanked into the net, right? Th that's just not the actual image, the actual figure that we need to see this whole concept of responding to the invitation of Christ in. If you're going to respond, you will have to respond. If you're going to respond, there's going to have to be something in you that sees it as the thing to do, that sees it as the necessary thing to do, and not only necessary, but to see things to see things in the way that 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 is what you want to do. Because if you are not participating in this, then you're not going to come. Right? You're not going to come in the way that you need to come. You're not going to come in, in the way that is in line with what Jesus said about his invitation to come. You've got to find something in your heart that wants to come. Right? It's not like you're without help. I mean, there's plenty of scriptures that tell us about the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the drawing, the wooing of the Holy Spirit. You know, if we were left to our own devices, we would never make that decision. But we're not left to our own devices. God is work, at work in invisible ways through the Holy Spirit, tugging, poking, prodding at our inner person, at, at, at who we are deep down inside in a spiritual place. God is at work and He's giving an invitation. You know, I don't know that it would come in English, but it's in whatever spiritual sense and spiritual way of communication that it needs to come to reach the very deepest places of your inward being. And God says, come. Come. Come to me. And something inside of you, as a response to that work that God is doing inside of you, it's like the lights have to go on and you have to say, I want to come. I'm going to come. And, and when that reality is in your soul, what's the, the final conclusion of all of the, these words and whatnot that we've been looking at? Well, we have a double negative. Now, they tell you in English that's, not, that's a bad thing. But in other languages, a double negative is not necessarily a bad thing. Jesus ends this verse with a double negative. And he says that, that, that all those who come to him, he will in no wise cast out, as it says in the King James, and some other English translations will phrase that slightly different. But, but no matter how they phrase it, it rests on a double negative in the Greek. And the double negative is not an error, not in that language. It's a way of emphasizing. It's a way of emphasizing how rock solid what, about, uh, what, is, uh, what is about to be said is actually. And so when he says there's no way that we're going to be cast out because it comes with the emphasis of that double negative, it means there's, there's not a snowball's chance in hell that this isn't going to work, that this isn't going to produce the result that's promised. So when he says, all those who come to me, I will in no wise cast out, what he's saying to, to us is that if we come to Jesus, there is no way that will fail. There is no way that that's going to fail to bring us to Jesus. There's no way that that will fail to deliver us into the very hand of God. There's no way that that will not produce a good end for us. That's the invitation that we have from Christ Jesus. I think that's a fantastic invitation. It's, a, it's an invitation that you can stand on and not sway in the wind. It's an invitation that can undergird your life and can give you the basis upon which to launch even a, a new direction in life. You know, if you're shaky about where you belong <coughs> with Christ, where you belong with God, and even if you think the cross was a wonderful grace of God to provide such a, such a cleansing, such a forgiveness, and he put an exclamation point at the end of it by rising from the dead. I mean, does the cross work? 
I mean, we don't have the same kind of language that we're looking at in this verse, uh, you know, to, to speak about. But yeah, it does. And how do we know that the cross works? Because Jesus came out of the tomb. He overcame our worst enemy. The enemy that we could not defeat. The enemy that we could not escape. Jesus overcame it. And, and in doing so, he's saying in big, bold headlines, what I have done for you works. <laughs> If you don't want to die and be lost to God forever, if you don't want to die and be tossed in a lake that burns with fire, if you don't want to die and face the consequences of sin and debauchery, if you don't want to die and have all of those misfortunes come your way in eternity, you can depend on the cross. It is vouchsafed by the resurrection of Christ and because he rose from the dead, we know that whatever he said about death and about sin and about forgiveness can be counted on. I mean, he didn't do a magic trip, tr trick. He didn't, uh, he didn't play sleight of hand. He did the impossible right in front of everyone's face. And he says, by doing so, hey, I know what it takes to overcome death. I know what it takes to be forgiven. I know what it takes to be right with God. And I've just provided it to you. And just so that you know, I, I, I rose from the dead so that you have no doubts about this. It, then we get you an invitation like we're looking at today, and we see that Jesus speaking words to us that basically get across a very similar idea, right? There is no way this fails. There's no way the blood of Christ fails. There's no way the promise of Christ fails. There's no way responding to the invitation of Christ to come to him, there's no way that fails. Right? Now, that's not to say a couple of other things that we probably need to talk about, right? Um, like, what does it mean to come to Christ exactly? I mean, I've been using that phrase a lot this morning, but I haven't really defined it yet or described it. How, how might we do that? Well, I think if you look at verse 35 here in this, this same chapter, you'll see everything that you need that will help you understand what it means to come to Christ. Now, that particular verse is really a Hebraism. You, you, we get these in the New Testament. You know, everybody who was speaking or writing in the New Testament was actually a Jew. They were all Hebrews. And so from their experience of the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament and that particular language culture... Um, they would, uh, you know, they would often phrase things uh, in idioms that were familiar to Hebrews, uh, to uh, the Hebrew language, or they would say things that were fitting some kind of convention within the Hebrew language. And we see that in verse number 35, where uh, there uh, Jesus equates coming to him with believing in him. Uh, let me read it to you just so that you see it. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. And say, well, where's the Hebraism? It's in the parallel. Right? Hebrews use parallelism to make points, to say things poetically, to say things with, with some you know, basic uh, uh, artistic panache. <laughs> uh, he, the, the Hebrews will say things by using parallels. That's the way that their language works. And parallels often will, will give you a phrase talking about something, and then it will repeat a similar kind of phrase with, with something that is meant to convey the same thought. And so you have a phrase that says something, and then you have another phrase that's saying the same thing in different words. And so you know that these two things are equated. And so when he says, uh, in verse number 35, if you come to me, right, you're never going to thirst, you're never going to hunger. Uh, if you believe in me, and so in that second, that second part of that parallel, he explains what he means by, you know, the more figurative language of coming to him. And basically it comes down to just believing in him. Now what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Well, I think we've talked about that, especially through this series, but it's always good to talk about this, so I'm going to talk about it again. Right? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Do you, I mean, do you have to just believe in the existence of Christ? Yeah, I believe Jesus was a historical figure. Or maybe, you know, it's even worse. Yeah, I believe Jesus is a myth. Now, I've got to tell you, 
That won't get you anywhere. But just merely believing in the existence of Jesus is not enough either. I mean, you have to make some value judgments about Jesus for, for it to be said that you really believe in him. Because, you know, if you believe in Jesus, the reality of what it is that you are believing is going to cause some reaction, right? So when we say that we believe in Jesus, uh, what does it mean for that to actually have some kind of meaning, to actually uh, have some kind of substance? Well, it means that you are recognizing who he is and that he has what it takes for you to have life. Whether you're talking about hunger or whether you're talking about thirst, I mean, you have to see Jesus in a certain light to actually have faith in him. You have to see him as the Savior, the one who has what you need to have life with God. You have to see him as Savior and you have to see him as Lord. When you see Jesus in this light, when you are seeing Jesus in this way, this is really the heart and soul of believing in him. And it's really the heart and soul of coming to him. Because would you come to Jesus if he was like me? Right? You know, let's face it. I mean, there's a lot of things I can do for you. But there's a lot of things I can't. I can't give you everlasting bread. I can't give you everlasting drink. I can't wave away your sins with, you know, just a spilling of my blood. I, I can't do that. You know, if you ask me about the wrong thing, I, you know, I probably couldn't even help you there. If you ask me what makes, like, for instance, the Philadelphia Eagles good, I'd be dumbfounded. No answer whatsoever. You wouldn't come to me, right? You wouldn't come to me if, if it just seemed like I was iffy, or maybe I was totally out to lunch, or maybe I was not really honest. Would you come to me? No, you'd probably turn around and go the other way. Why come to somebody who's like that? Well, that's exactly the point, right? In, in equating coming to him and believing in him, this is, this is you know, kind of how we have to see this making sense and working out. To come to him means that you are willing in your mind and in your heart to say, this is the guy who has what I need. I need my sins forgiven. I need to be right with God. I need to be put in a position where death does not rule over me anymore, but everlasting life has come my way. I, I need these things. And so when you come to Jesus, these are the eyeglasses you're looking through. This is the guy who can do that. This is the guy who can give me life. This is the guy who can wash away my sins. This is the guy who can make me right with God now and forever. This is the guy. So you come. Now what Jesus is saying in this text, hopefully that we've got this, this much, put all these thoughts together. What Jesus is saying in our text is if we come to him like this, it's not going to fail. We're not going to be turned away. It says here that I will never cast them out. Some other versions will use some other language for this. But, you know, basically that comes to being thrown out. You know, there's no bouncers at the door of heaven. Despite all the silly jokes that you've heard through the year. Guy walks up to the pearly gates and Peter's sitting on the side. You know, you know, you know all of those silly jokes, right? And, you know, <coughs> treat Peter like maybe he's the gatekeeper, he's the bouncer. I want to tell you today, that's a totally wrong conception. There's no bouncer at the door of heaven. You know, think about this for a second. Would an omniscient God need a bouncer? <laughs> An all omniscient, omnipotent God certainly wouldn't need a bouncer. And that's what God is. He sees all. He's all powerful. He doesn't need anybody to watch his gate. He doesn't need anyone to watch his back. You know, let that, let that, uh, let that thought be with you whenever, whenever somebody is speaking ill of God, and somehow or another you think it's your duty to have God's back and to, you know, to fight them tooth and nail until they yield and admit they're wrong about the beauty of God. Um, you know, we, sometimes we can, uh, we can make things worse uh, in, in pursuing those kinds of courses. You know, God's capable of taking care of himself. Right? God's capable of, of demonstrating who he is to people. 
And uh, you know, if they're if they're bound and determined to to hold a false opinion about God, it's not like you're going to beat it out of them. You're certainly not going to talk it out of them. Maybe you might example it out of them, right? Living before them some kind of spectacularly, wonderfully holy life that makes them rethink their their path. But by and large, you know. When people come to the light of God, it's because the Holy Spirit's doing something in places that we can't see. Right? But the long and short of everything that we're saying here this morning is just this. If you're coming to Christ because you know He has the goods, there is just no way in the world that's going to fail. There's no way that that's going to ever be impotent, and there's no way that's ever not going to be honored. It doesn't matter who you are, how speckled you are. It doesn't matter how smart or how dumb you are. It doesn't matter what kind of, of past you have. It doesn't matter what kind of sins you've committed. It doesn't matter how broken you are as you're stumbling toward Christ. None of those things matter. You are not the issue for anything else than coming. Nothing about you is in any way, shape, or form operative in making this happen other than just coming. You have to participate in that. But as far as anything else about you, as far as anything that you're worried about, as far as anything else you might be embarrassed by or ashamed of, none of that matters. None of that matters. You know, if Adolf Hitler would have come to his senses and come to Christ, this would have worked. If Genghis Khan, who was probably the most evil person that ever lived on planet Earth, if he would have come to Christ, guess what? It would have worked. It would have worked. And if you come to Christ, I don't think any of you are Adolf Hitler or Genghis Khan. Eh, maybe... <laughs> if any of you will respond to the invitation of Christ to come and have life, life everlasting, forgiveness of sin, if you will respond to the invitation, Christ himself will welcome you into his presence. Christ will lay hold of you and call you his own. I mean, that's really what that means when it says all that the Father gives me. I mean, Jesus is actually talking about something that's being given over as a possession. If you will come to Christ, you will be his possession. You will come into his favor. You will come into his blessing. There's nothing about you that can prevent this or hinder it. There is nothing at all in, the, in anything about you at all that will stop this. All you have to do is come. And if you come, it will absolutely, inevitably work. It will work every time, as they say. It will work, and you will be saved. Fed with a food that doesn't give out. Given drink with a drink that never fails to slake. Let me ask you this morning. Have you come to Christ? Do you see him the right way? I mean, in your mind, when you think about Jesus, what do you think? This is just a dude? This is just some old guy who walked around a long time ago? Hopefully you don't think this was just a myth. But what are you thinking about Jesus? Do, do you think maybe instead, or are you to the place where you can say, well, you know, I, I think Jesus is the Son of God. I, I think Jesus has life. I think Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I, yeah, I, I, I think that. Well, if you think that, you're seeing the right thing. Have you followed it up by coming? I mean, have you clearly in your mind said to yourself, Jesus is the way. He's, he's got what it takes. I'm going to Jesus. I'm going to give myself to Jesus. Since the Father's given me to Jesus, I'm going to give myself to Jesus. I'm going to be His. Have you done that? Is that the way that you see it? 
if you do, won't fail. Right? It won't fail. There's no doubt at all about your situation with God. No doubt at all about your eternal destiny. No doubt at all about your forgiveness. If you come to Jesus. Have you come to Jesus? Jesus.